For our meditation shall be all turned to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. We have to read the first 13 verses, so probably I will ask all of you to join. We can all open our Bibles. And we're going to read the first 13 verses. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. Are you all ready? You must all read aloud. Matthew 25, 1 to 13. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lambs and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Matthew's Gospel chapter 25 contains three significant events and they are all events pertaining to our future the first is the parable of the ten virgins that we just read the second is the parable of the talents and the three servants who receive them and finally it is an account of the judgment day and the sheep and the goats who will stand before him Whenever Jesus uses the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like unto, as we see here it begins, kingdom of heaven is likened unto. So that it means he's comparing our future or heaven to these things. The parable of the talents, they tell us how one day we all have to give account to God. There is no one who can escape we all have to give an account to God about our lives and about all that he has given us. He says, I've given you something. What did you do with it? I've given you time. What did you do with it? I gave you opportunities. What did you do with it? You had opportunities to be more faithful. There are others who do not have those opportunities. I gave them to you. What did you do? So we have a day to give an account. And the final event that is the judgment of the sheep and the goats, it gives us an insight as to the basis on which God will judge people. It's not like how we imagine when we read that, we will understand how God judges people. Our focus today, however, will be the first parable, the parable of the ten virgins. Jesus begins this chapter by using the word then. Which means, after those things. So, chapter 25 really is a continuation of chapter 24. And if you read chapter 24, it is all about the secret coming of Jesus. So, chapter 25 begins after that. Or, the parable of the ten virgins tells us what happens after the coming of Jesus, or after the rapture. So the ten virgins do not speak of those who are caught up in the rapture or anything like that, but it tells us of those who are left behind. They are here in this world after the rapture. 
And we know that after the rapture of the church, there will be seven years of tribulation in this world. Now the parables of Jesus must be understood spiritually. Every parable of Jesus is a story. And it's not just a story with a moral. It's more than that. Every line in that story has a spiritual meaning that we must understand. Here, the kingdom of heaven speaks of new heaven. The kingdom of God is new Jerusalem and the kingdom of heaven is new heaven. And we see ten women in this parable. In Bible symbology, the word woman speaks of a group of people, a, a spiritual body of people or a system or an organization or so on. That is why even in the Old Testament we find phrases like the daughter of Egypt, not meaning a single person but a group of people. We read the daughter of Tyre, the daughter of Jerusalem, all referring to a group of people. Here we read of women. Now, we read of ten women here and these ten women are referred to as virgins. Why are they called virgins? Because it tells us that there is some form of purity in their lives. They are some, they have been, have been those who had a measure of purity. But we must understand that this purity in them, it did not take them up when Jesus came. They were virgins. They had a measure of purity and yet they were left behind. We must also think about our purity. Yes, we may have a measure of purity. We won't do the things that the people of the world do. We don't uh, desire the things that they desire. We are happy that there's a difference. But we must again think about it. We may be like the ten virgins, having a measure of purity and yet being left behind. There are different kinds of purity which don't really measure up to the standard that Jesus expects. For example, cultural purity. There's something called cultural purity. Eastern or Middle Eastern people have in them a cultural purity. Say for example, a Hindu mother or a, a Muslim mother. If you look at the way she brings up her children, you will find that she is not having a Western outlook. She will bring them up in a very uh, strict manner about the way they behave and the friends they keep. And, and they, are, they, they sometimes, I used to think of the Hindu mothers I knew when I was in India and compare them to the Christian mothers of the different assemblies where I have been. And I used to often see that the Hindu mothers were more strict with their own children. And I was a bit confused. These are Christians. Those are Hindus. And how come they seem closer to God and they seem to love purity more? Now what we must understand is that purity is called cultural purity. It has nothing to do with Calvary. It has nothing to do with the blood of Jesus. It has nothing to do with salvation. It is simply the way they have been brought up. It is the place that they have been brought up. If they were brought up in another place, they would have been like that place. It has nothing to do with a change of life or what God has done for them. We too as Christians, we may be having only what is called this cultural purity because of the background we have been in and the church that we have been brought up or the pastors who have been strict with us. We can be just reflecting what we have been given from childhood, the way we have been brought up. And yet, if this purity or the zeal to keep our lives pure is not really motivated by the love of Jesus, if it is not motivated by the cross of Jesus, then we can be left behind. There is no value to the holiness which is not 
motivated by the love of Jesus. That is why St. Paul speaks of how it is the love of God within us that makes us holy in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 12 and verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 12 and verse 13. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men. Okay. See, St. Paul is saying, May God increase our love toward one another and toward all men. Next verse. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Did you understand that? Jesus is coming again with all his saints. Who are these saints? Those who are the other dead in Christ. The saints who have died perfect, Jesus will be bringing them. And the, those who are living will rise up to meet him in the air. And that is the day of his return. And for that day, our hearts have to be unblameable in holiness before God. And in order to get that holiness, what do we read? In order to get that holiness, in verse 12 we read, The Lord must help us to increase in love toward one another and toward all men. Some believers, they love their family so much. But they don't have that same love towards other believers. Some have a love towards believers, but they don't have the same love towards the people they work with. When I say love, I don't mean just a carnal love. We can have a carnal love, but where there is carnal love, there will also be strife, there will be arguments, there will be jealousy. But we must exercise divine love toward all men. And it is that love that drives us to keep our lives pure. We read of the ten virgins. They were virgins. But I am not sure what was driving them. Definitely they were not motivated by the love of God. And they were left behind. If you go back now to Matthew's Gospel chapter 25. In verse 1 we read that these ten virgins took their lamps. All ten virgins had lamps. What are these lamps? Or when did they get these lamps? We know this incident is taking place soon after the secret coming of Jesus. And they already had their lamps before that. So they are actually the saints or the, the Christians left behind from the grace period. And they received their lamps in the grace period itself. We are all given lamps during this grace period. What are these lamps? These lamps are our spiritual lives. Our lives are compared to lamps. God pours His oil into our lives. And our lamps must always contain the, that oil. And this oil is so important that these ten virgins have been divided into two groups, wise and foolish, on the basis of the presence or absence of that oil, not the lamps. Remember, they all had lamps. They all had a certain measure of spirituality. They all had a certain measure of purity. If you think of the presidential candidates of Ireland, they must basically all have a certain measure of purity, a testimony, saying, I did not steal, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, that's why I'm now wanting to be a president. During an interview, Sean Gallagher, who is at the moment leading in the polls, who is probably going to be our president, he testified about himself and he said, I am a spiritual man. He's a Catholic and he calls himself a spiritual man. Everybody who 
has some faith in some power them or they they go to church they may consider themselves to be spiritual these virgins were more they were more than just you know this basic spirituality but we see the the fact of the oil divided them into two groups the wise and the foolish that is what we read in verse 2 verse 3 and verse 4 five of them were wise and five were foolish they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them but the wise took oil in their vessels with the lamps as we've been hearing the oil speaks of the grace of god the period that we are now living in is called the period of grace and this period or dispensation of grace will last until the coming of jesus now it is in this period of grace that we can obtain the grace of god or obtain oil we can obtain oil for our lamps now now is the time when it is available god is making it available for us and there are many ways that we can obtain the oil of his grace first of all we understand that to obtain this oil we have to humble ourselves if you can read james chapter 4 james chapter 4 verse 6 but he giveth more grace wherefore he saith god resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble he giveth grace unto the humble you can also just note down first peter chapter 5 verse 5 he gives grace to the humble why does he give grace to the humble what, what do we understand or what is this humility actually if you can think of a shop where oil is sold i don't know where you buy your oil but you know that every shop in this world today unless if it's a, it's a 24 hour shop we see every shop closes and opens but the shop of grace never closes it is always open and grace is always available how do we obtain that grace by humbling ourselves now god he wants us to collect as much grace as possible when we have the opportunity what is that opportunity he will give us an opportunity to humble ourselves every day if you are a child of god every day god will give you an opportunity to humble yourself you humble yourself before god to humble yourself before men to humble yourself before your family sometimes to humble yourself before your children god gives us precious opportunities to humble ourselves and every time you humble yourself you are receiving oil your vessel is being filled with oil the contrary is or the converse is true every time you don't humble yourself you are losing a fresh supply of oil the oil that is referred to here is olive oil if you read exodus chapter 27 verse 20 we see how it was pure olive oil that was used for these lamps exodus 27:20 and thou shall command the children of israel that they bring thee pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always okay you have to bring pure olive oil in the old testament there was no olive oil being sold in a bottle to obtain olive oil how did they what did they do olives had to be crushed for the oil to flow out that is how they obtained oil in the old testament the bible tells us that we are like 
olives. The psalmist says, He hath made me a green olive tree. And we also read how our children are like olive plants. We are compared to olives. St. Paul says we were wild olives, but he has grafted us into the true tree. We are compared to olives. And for the oil to flow out, we have to be crushed. God will take us through crushing experiences. But we have a defense mechanism naturally fitted into us. Every time the hand comes to crush us, we resist the crushing. We don't want to be crushed. We avoid the crushing. When people tell us to shut up, we won't shut up. We won't be crushed. When people offend us, instead of refusing to be offended, instead of humbling ourselves, we get offended. Every opportunity when a person turns against us or does something to us, that is an opportunity to receive oil. Pure olive oil by allowing ourselves to be crushed. Every time we are crushed, the oil flows out into the vessel. But when we fail to humble ourselves, we lose that supply of oil. Some vessels are dry today. No oil. Why? They never get crushed. Who are those who never get crushed? They are those who do, the, who do the ministry of crushing others. They seem to have it as a job. My ministry is to crush others. So if that my ministry is to crush other people, if anyone comes to crush me, I will crush them because that's my ministry. I will never end up being crushed. I will always crush the other person. It's a beautiful ministry because through me, so many people are going to receive oil. Some are good suppliers of oil. They crush others and give them oil. So we must be grateful to them. Whether in the church or at work, your boss or your substitute or your someone under you, doesn't matter. Anybody who crushes you, be grateful to God for them. Be grateful to them also. Because they are the ones who are supplying oil for you. When we resist that crushing, we will lose that oil. There are other methods also to receive oil. I'm not going to detail. But another method to receive oil or receive the grace of God is by obedience. When we obey the Lord without murmuring, without complaining, and we surrender to His will, it brings grace into our lives. Also, according to St. Paul's teachings, when we have a grateful heart, when we have a thankful heart, that brings grace. Grace abounds, redounds, St. Paul says, by the thanksgiving of many. When our hearts are grateful, you know, a person with a grateful heart, do a little thing for them, they are so grateful. One small little thing you do for them, they become so grateful. Some people, their hearts are so hard, no matter how much you do for them. I remember when I was, many, many years ago, so you can relax. Many, many years ago, when I was working in a place, there was a new family who came to church. And uh, they were in big trouble. And they often needed help. And their help was mainly at night. There were demon manifestations in the house and so many problems. So they came into contact with, the, with us and as servants of God we told them, we are on call 24 hours, 7 days a week. So anytime you need us, we are there for you. And I never imagined they would really accept that offer with all their heart, soul and mind and strength and they made full use of their opportunity almost every night either 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock we would get a phone call and I would knock on the wall and tell my co-worker please sister 15 minutes 15 minutes at 2 in the morning 3 in the morning we would take the car and go out and have a 
big session, five hours of prayer and then come back. It turned our lives upside down. I used to call it the owl ministry. And uh, yet we were happy to do it. And all through we were so happy to pour out our lives. Months went by. And there was this one particular morning when I had called all the children to the faith home and we were going to have our children's day practice. And uh, the children arrived and we were about to begin when the phone rang. And it was that family and they said, please can you come now? We need prayer. I said, you know, I would love to come now. Unfortunately, I can't because the children are here and we have to have a practice with them so I will not be able to make it. They became so upset, so angry. Oh, brother doesn't care for us anymore. And I was surprised by their reaction. They so easily forgot all that they received and in one moment I could see how hard their heart was. There was no gratitude, absolutely no gratitude for what they had received. What was the result is very pathetic. They, they left the church in the end and their lives went into a really, really tragic state. Not because of what they did that day, but because of their own hearts. Their hearts were so hard, there was no gratitude, no grace in their lives. We must always be grateful for the smallest benefit. For the tiniest blessing, say, how can you be grateful? Who can be grateful for the smallest blessing? The person who realizes he is not worthy for even that. It is when you think you are worthy, as I have often told you about beggars. Who is a beggar? A beggar is a beggar. You know what that means? It's not philosophy. A beggar is a beggar meaning he's begging. He's not earning. When in the end if he can shake his bowl and it makes a clinking noise, he must know I did not earn that. I begged for it and I don't deserve it. I got it out of mercy. So every time someone drops something, he has to be thinking. It doesn't matter how big the coin is or how heavy the coin is or what color the coin is. The fact that someone dropped something must make him grateful. And how in India that day they had a beggar's march demanding a minimum. I couldn't understand that. A beggar is a beggar. He can't demand anything. So the, when we realize we are only beggars, for every little thing God gives us, we will be grateful. We will never forget the tiniest mercies of God. And that gratitude is what continues to help supply grace. We further read that as we empty ourselves, every opportunity we have to empty ourselves, God fills us with grace. And also when we abide in the death of Jesus, all these things have to be explained, no time for details. But when we abide in the death of Jesus, or we are, we are always knit to the cross, united with the cross and our life comes from Calvary. We are not living by our own strength, but we are living by Calvary. Then we start enjoying more of this grace, more of this oil. Now we must get this supply of grace before the door of grace is shut. Is there anything in that passage? About the door of grace being shut. Did you read of anything there in that passage? Matthew 25. What does it say? And the door was shut. Is that the door of grace? The door of grace is already shut before this chapter begins. The period of grace is over. So it's not that door I'm speaking of. Even before the chapter begins, the door of grace, grace period is over with Matthew chapter 24. Now we are on this side of Matthew 24. We are still living in a period before the door of grace gets shut. 
So now, while we can, we must receive the grace of God. Those who receive that oil, they are called wise people. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 20 tells us that there will be oil in the house or the dwelling of those who are wise. Proverbs 21 20 There is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise. Oil in the dwelling of the wise. That is why here we read of the wise virgins. They had oil in their vessels. But what about the foolish virgins? To which dispensation did they belong? They are also Christians. They are also members of this church. Probably Pentecostal. But they had no oil. Anyone here who is a foolish virgin? Any foolish virgin here? You may have some measure of purity, but there is no oil in your lamp. All foolish virgins, lift up your hands and say hallelujah. So you're listening carefully, right? So you better not be a foolish virgin. All the wise virgins would like to be a wise virgin. Put up your hand and shout hallelujah. Anyway, I, I do this in every assembly where I go and I catch at least a few fish. All those who said hallelujah, you're going to regret it. Who are those whom we are studying about? Those who are left behind. And by shouting hallelujah, I want to be a wise virgin. The fundamental fact is that you want to be left behind. So please... Don't be a foolish or a wise virgin because that means you will be left behind. So let us now zoom in our attention, focus more on the five wise virgins. We do not want to consider the foolish so much, but let us look at the wise virgin. First of all, they are virgins. Secondly, they have lamps. Thirdly, they even have oil. Can you see their standard? They have a measure of purity. They have lamps or their lives are spiritual. They have oil or there is grace in their lives. And with all this, they are still left behind. Why? What is the reason that these wise virgins are left behind? There, we can cite so many reasons. But I'm focusing only on this passage. So we can analyze one or two reasons from this chapter. First of all, in verse 5, why do, what do we read? While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Not just the foolish. They all slumbered and slept. Why did they slumber and sleep? Because the bridegroom is tarrying or delaying. The word delaying, it means delaying. While the bridegroom waited or delayed his coming, they fell, they all slumbered and slept. Who are these people? They were those at the beginning, they were revived. At the beginning, they were waiting. But when the bridegroom delayed, then... They all slumbered and slept. Now that's the nature of man. When Moses went on top of the mount, all the Israelites were waiting at the foot of the mount. And they said, Moses has gone up. And this Moses is going to come down. This Moses is going to come down. And next morning, they must have risen early. And they said, look, look, can you see, can you see? I can see, I can see. That it looks like Moses coming down. And later they must have seen, probably it was some mountain goat or something. And so they thought, okay, false alarm, let's still wait. They're waiting, waiting, waiting. And Moses did not come down. Two days passed, three days passed, four days passed. And then they thought, this Moses who went up doesn't seem to be coming down. 
How long are we going to wait? And seeing that Moses delayed his coming, you can read that passage in Exodus, you'll see how because Moses delayed, what did they do? They started talking to Aaron and said, Aaron, you make us other gods so that we can worship other gods. And what did Aaron do? He made other gods for them. He made the golden calf and they began. You see, in that short period of time, they, when, the, when Moses delayed, their vision changed. Here also we see of the ten virgins, when the bridegroom delayed, they slumbered and slept. We must understand this spiritually. We may sleep during prayer meetings. We may sleep during sermons. Now, while meetings are going on, we may sleep and probably a little mobile phone may wake us up or something like that. But what I'm trying to say is, it is not this spirit, this is not the sleep I'm talking about. Sleeping during a sermon can be during, because of some kind of a sickness. There was a terrible epidemic of sleeping sickness from 1915 to 1926 by an African firefly. And uh, it's a sickness. And some people have got a, a sickness of sleep. And that sickness made their brain swell and one of the symptoms was drowsiness. And it probably the, the sickness in our body when we are very sweet people, excessive sugar, then we find that drowsiness is a symptom. Now that's physical sleep. And that is not what this passage is about. They all fell asleep and they were sleeping when Jesus came. Now that's not what this verse is all about. There is a spiritual sleep that we have to be careful of. The psalmist says in Psalm 13 verse 3, he speaks about the spiritual sleep. We will also look at a verse in the New Testament. But first Psalm 13 verse 3. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Why is it called the sleep of death? Because you wake up only on the other side. Meaning, now you are asleep, but you're not going to wake up now. You're going to wake up only beyond death. Spiritually, what does that mean? I will explain it after we read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Let us not sleep as do others. So what is St. Paul saying? We must never sleep. If that is what he is saying, we are finished. But obviously, it's so obvious that St. Paul is speaking of a different kind of sleep. He is not speaking of physical sleep because even Jesus fell asleep. So there is another sleep that he is speaking of. And in the next verse, he compares that sleep with drunkenness. And he says, those who sleep, they sleep in the night. Those who are drunken are drunken in the night. What is common between sleep and drunkenness? Why does a man drink? What happens when a man... Is there anyone here who has ever gone silly on the drink? Drunk yourselves silly, anyone? Okay, we have two people. What happens when... When you've drunk and it goes right up to your brain, you get a kick and then what happens? You forget all your problems. At that moment, say, say, Brother Binu is drunk today, fully up, you know, to the top. He will say, there's no need for presidential election because I am the president of Ireland. And I'll tell you, he will mean it. Because he'll really think it. Because that's what a drunken man is. He forgets reality. He gets stupefied. He enters into another world. And he enjoys that world. But what is the truth? After a while, the effect wears out. You come back and your last state is worse than the first. So what do you have to do? You have to drink a little more. 
and that's how they finally become slaves of alcohol i met so many people who who drink and they've told me they hate the alcohol they said the taste is horrible but they had to because it just helped them to forget their sorrows saint paul is comparing spiritual sleep to drinking why a spiritual a person who sleeps spiritually he becomes unaware he's like a drunkard he becomes unaware of what is happening around in the world or in the church or we become ignorant an ignorance takes over our lives a, sp- a person can be sitting in a meeting completely awake I, I, some some of our believers here also are in that state i'm sorry to say they are sitting in this meeting listening to the same message that you are all listening to but nothing enters in they can't understand anything why because a sleeping man is unaware if a fire breaks out in the neighborhood a sleeping man continues to sleep if a thief breaks into the house he continues to sleep steal all his jewelry he continues to sleep no matter what happens he enjoys he snores and sleep because he is asleep that is sleep spiritually when we are asleep when god warns us when god counsels us when god rebukes us we are not aware and when the signs of his coming are taking place we are not aware we become immune to everything and we enter into that state of suspended time where we don't flow with what is happening but we enter into some kind of imaginary paradise and we like it i remember there was a particular believer who used to often fall asleep and uh, i asked the council of my leaders how do i deal with this person they said is he sleeping all the time even during the prayer i said yes then probably that person has a lot of sorrow in his life when we have a lot of sorrow in our lives we can do two things we either love to sleep we choose to sleep because sleep helps us to forget everything or we we love to joke and when we joke excessively actually we are covering up a sadness inside so we want to be drunk or we want to sleep or we want to become oblivious to reality and what happens we enter into that state of sleep and we can be in a pentecostal church when god warns us we don't respond to the warning when the spirit starts convicting 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 i wonder how many of you last week can say i stayed in that meeting where the points about self was given i felt nothing if you say i felt nothing it doesn't mean those 80 points don't mean anything about you it simply means this it means you are in a sleep you have entered into a state of sleep and some of our children also can be in that state coming to the church hearing the sermons hearing the warnings but they feel nothing they have entered into a state of sleep remember samson he lost his strength when he was asleep in the lap of a woman and we don't read that he fell asleep in her lap we read that she put him to sleep on her lap see so many things can lull us into a sleep and we fail to realize what is happening the 10 virgins fell asleep not just the foolish ones even the wise ones though they collected oil maybe in times of trouble when someone opposes you you humble yourself maybe you've got a humble character yes you get oil but are you awake are you aware that jesus is coming soon if that awareness is not in you think again are you a sleeping saint that is why often we have to sing o church awake arise and shine why do we have to sing o church awake because instead of being a weeping church 
we are a sleeping church so we have to keep trying to wake up the church by singing that song we do not want to sleep like these wise virgins let us therefore remain awake and alert in verse 6 matthew 25 verse 6 we read matthew 25 6 And at midnight there was a cry made behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him At midnight What does it speak of Does it speak of the time when Jesus will come No because Jesus can come at any time he can come in the day or night or any time we we don't specify a certain time and we know that this is Oh, everything is about the period after his coming midnight is the middle of two days or we can say spiritually this speaks of the middle of the seven years tribulation if god opens a way and i really want to teach you all about the 10 dispensations because it contains so many precious truths and when we study that dispensation of tribulation we'll understand about the seven years and of the different events that occur in order and how in the middle of the seven years jesus will return now this is not the secret coming of jesus how many times does jesus come four times the first time he already came that's our christmas the first christmas and the next time he comes will be the secret coming of jesus when he comes to take away his bride the time after that will be to take away the tribulation martyrs who have died and then finally the public advent when he comes to establish the millennial kingdom on this earth now in that midnight he returns to gather the tribulation martyrs how many tribulation martyrs in this parable Fifteen, twenty, or ten. If you are understanding, you will say five. If not, you will say ten. Five are foolish. Five are wise. Who was ready when the bridegroom came? We see here when bridegroom Jesus came. Behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him Then what happened who heard that cry all of them heard it and in verse 7 and 8 and 9 as we go on we see that it's only the wise who actually entered in And uh, you will notice one more thing about these wise they had the oil according to verse 4 they had the oil the wise took oil in their vessels but obviously they wasted that oil all the oil that they had in the grace period was not used for their lamp many believers have a certain grace now there are different ways to look at the grace i would say that if you have strength in your body i call that the grace of god it was when i came to a place when i didn't have strength when i had a weakness in a certain member say my back or my tooth or my leg when i had a terrible pain that was when i appreciated good health how many of you have good health that is the grace of god that is the oil of god but the question is what have you done with that oil some believers they have good health so what do they do they sleep well they must have 10 hours anybody who sleeps 10 hours here per day 10 hours i really wonder if you'll make it even for the tribulation because you will find people in the world all those who have made it to the top whether it is in the field of games or politics or anything else those who ever make it to the top are those who sacrifice their sleep they are while the others sleep they stay awake 
There must be a certain sacrifice. The Bible very clearly tells us, love not sleep. Why do we sleep? Because we have to. Do not sleep because you want to. Some people, they are walking around in their room and then they say, Hey, what's that? Oh, that's my bed. It looks so nice. It looks so nice, warm and cozy. Let me go and feel it. And they go in and they get lost because they don't know how to come out. Afternoon sleep. Evening sleep. Night sleep. Morning sleep. Sleep, be careful. Even though it's only physical sleep, still don't love that sleep. We sleep because we have to. There are times we have to sleep out or we'll wear out. So we allow ourselves, it's just like a mobile phone. Sometimes you realize it's running out of charge and then you need it. And then what do you do? You just let it charge for five minutes. That five minutes will give you maybe another 15 minutes of conversation. We sometimes give ourselves just that little sleep. We don't love sleep. That is the grace of God. Because God has given us good health. As long as we have that health, let us give it to the Lord. Has God given you time? Has He given you opportunities? Has He given you a way to come to church? Some people say, Oh, I don't come for the meetings, you know, because... I don't have a car or I don't have you know enough transport facilities. What would you do if I told you about believers who had absolutely none of these things and they yet struggled and somehow made it when I was transferred to Leicester in the UK. I was told about the mothers in Leicester, the Caribbean mothers. If you meet them, they come quietly to the church and go. They seem to be very ordinary people. But every one of them has a story behind them. For one an example, there's one mother there in Leicester. And I was told she had no car. But she and her little son, when she was healthy, they would walk to the meetings nearly 20 or 25 miles. Walk and I remember when I was there, I drove to a house and it was a journey that wouldn't end. And when I heard that she used to walk that whole distance and I was told that she was the one who was on time every Sunday. And I was told that she would walk in winter when the roads were covered with ice, she would still walk and come. Today, when, when I went to Leicester, that mother was blind. I saw her when she was walking into the church hall. She had to feel for the door and walk in. But till today she has never missed a meeting. As long as God has given her two legs, even if she doesn't have two eyes, she said, God never gave me eyes to walk. He gave me legs to walk. And if I can walk, I can come for a meeting. And she was always present. Even in a morning prayer, where no one else was there, she would be there. What beautiful mothers. But you know one thing? When they stand before the Lord, they can give an account to God how they did not waste the oil. Lord, what you gave me, I gave it back to you. I used it wisely. Here we read of these wise virgins. The oil was in their vessels. It was not used for the lamp. And then in verse 8, what do we read about them? No, verse, sorry, verse 7. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. All of them arose and trimmed their lamps. Why? Because they had not been trimmed. They were not trimmed when it had to be trimmed. Trimming of the weak, as we heard, it speaks of correction. This is a, a very important part of our Christian life. Before I continue, let me ask that question. Do you receive correction? First of all, does God correct you? Sometimes God can correct you directly. He can correct you through a dream. He can correct you through a message. 
He can correct you through a situation. Secondly, God can use people to correct you. Is there correction in your life? Do you surrender to that correction? Sometimes we deliberately refuse to cooperate because we are being corrected. Because your wife tells you, can you do the washing up? Because she told you, you won't do it. Had she not told you, maybe you would do it. Once Pastor Abraham was talking to me, he said, it's very easy to humble ourselves, but it's very hard to be humbled. How true it is. We will humble ourselves and do something. But when someone else tells us to do it, it becomes very hard. We would do it if, well, stop forcing me, I will do it. Stop pestering me, then I will do it. We don't want to come down. We don't want to be trimmed. We do not want to be corrected. We do not want to be crushed. I was listening to a survey of the UK. And I heard that on an average, every family in a year, on an average, has 135 quarrels in the house. That's, just say, roughly about a quarrel. How many quarrels? 135 in a year. Probably once in three days. You're having a, a quarrel. Here, I don't know, probably every day. You can't go to sleep unless something, you know, you feel the day is incomplete unless you bark. You have to do something. You have to say something nasty. Somehow the day ends. Then there was a list. The list of reasons for the quarrel. The top ten. Top ten reasons. There were so many reasons. A prominent reason is washing up, doing the dishes, putting the bin out. Mostly to do with it. But the number one reason is clothes lying all over the house. My husband, he's got this habit, he just can't. He takes his socks off, wherever he takes it off, it will lie there. Wherever he takes his shoes off, it will be parked there. Your whole house has become a parking lot. Clothes here, clothes there. You have to look and see under the clothes. And the children on Sunday morning, they say, no clothes. Where are your clothes? I don't know. I had this favorite excuse at home, at, at school. Whenever something's missing, I said, my mother took it. And I don't know what she did with it. It's always the mother's fault. I used to go to uh, Hanover for communion in Germany. And I had to stay in a house there every month. And they've got three lovely children. And uh, I used to admire the patience of the children. I thought, come on, if I were you, I don't know what I would have done. Saturday night, Sunday morning is the service. Saturday night, they have all to go to bed. And... These children are all hyperactive. They're all the time screaming, all the time laughing, all the time crying, all the time wanting attention. And then, while they're giving attention to one child, the other child comes crying. While they're feeding one child, the other child says, I also want. Okay, here. No, I don't want this. In this they say, I, I want kinder tea. Kinder tea means special tea for children in Germany. I want that. So they have to rush to the kitchen and make that. And this went on and on and on. Finally the mother said, Okay, can you please wear your night dress and go to sleep? And two minutes later the child came wearing her Sunday morning clothes. I thought, gosh, what is this? And I thought, now I know. I feel After that I feel sorry for all my poor believers. So these are all the time happening in the house. Chaos and confusion. All the time something going on. But in all this confusion, you can gain something. Everything is an opportunity for you to be corrected. Maybe you are naturally untidy. See how God gave you the right person to trim your wig. But every time the scissors come there, you flex your muscles and say, I dare you to cut me. I dare you. I won't change. I will be the same now and forevermore. Amen. We don't want to change. We don't want to be corrected. We don't want to be cut. 
Although deep in our hearts we know it is wrong. Say, I am untidy. But I praise God every day He gave me a wife who can clean up my mess. So, we are not allowing ourselves to be trimmed. Now, when we are resisting that trimming, we will lose that trimming experience. Finally, people will be fed up. And they'll say, there's no point telling you, I'm going to stop. That's a dangerous time. Because if people stop correcting us, it means we have lost something. You see, these virgins are trimming their wick after the coming of Jesus. Let us not receive any correction after. Now we must receive our correction. You know why? What does correction imply? Correction implies that we have a relationship with God. Because according to Hebrews chapter 12, He will correct only the son whom He loves. Hebrews chapter 12, you read verse 5 to 7. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. As unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Don't despise his chastening. Don't faint when he rebukes you. Now for, listen. Yeah. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Right. Now we have a brother in our midst called Brother Alex. His heart just stopped. He knew he had an urging he shouldn't come today. Alright, don't worry. I'm not going to do anything. Brother Alex has never ever scolded Jyotis. Am I right? Have you ever scolded Jyotis? No. Have you ever scolded Abraham? No. Have you ever scolded Joel? No. Have you ever scolded Alfie? Yes. Why? He's my son. He cannot scold someone who is not his son. He will only scold someone who is his own. When God scolds you, He dealeth with you as with sons, says the apostle. When God corrects us, it means we are related to Him. There is love in that. God does not correct illegitimate children according to the next verse. It's his own children, children whom he begat, that he will correct. But about these virgins we read, that they are trimming their wick or getting correction too late. Even during sermons, God trims the wick. That's why my sermons are like scissors. They are not like ice cream. Once I, I was a bit concerned that all my sermons were like razors and blades and swords and spears. And so I came back home. I was new in a certain assembly. I had co-workers and I asked one sister who had been in that assembly for a few years. I said, sister, are my messages too hard? She said, brother, don't worry, don't worry. You just preach whatever God gives you. I said, yes, but... What about the people? How would they react? She said, oh, I know them. They just take what they want, they leave the rest. <laughs> I thought, oh gosh. So it's not hard enough then. So we are just taking whatever we want. All the trimming we remove. And we just want the, the nice part. The juicy part. The story part. You know, once, you know what happened? Once. Ah, story time. Immediately, we, ah, yes, okay, another story. There was no story. That was just a demonstration. How we like all those juicy parts, but we don't like the hard parts. We refuse the trimming. And that is what happened to them. They refused to get trimmed. What can you understand from the three things about these wise virgins? There are three good things about them. One, they had, they were virgins. Secondly, they had their lamps with them. Thirdly, they had oil in their lamps. There were three good things about them. But look at the three bad things about them. One, they slept when they should have been awake. Secondly, they had oil, but they did not use it in the right way. 
Thirdly, they did not get trimmed when they had to get trimmed. What do you see about the three bad things about them? It was in general an attitude of carelessness. An attitude of carelessness. We are not called to be foolish virgins. We are not even called to be wise virgins. Scripture tells us we are called to be chaste virgins. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2. 2 Corinthians 11 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. St. Paul is the servant of God who is writing these words. And he says, I have espoused you to one husband. Or you are now engaged, betrothed to one man. And that is Jesus. And I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. This is our calling. This woman here is not a, one of the ten virgins. She is the bride of Christ. In Song of Solomon, we read about her. The unique quality about her. Because in Matthew 25, we read of 10 virgins, but in reality, the number is very great. According to Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 8, there are virgins without number. There are three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. Virgins without number. And that is true also about the tribulation martyrs, according to Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. What does John say about the tribulation martyrs? After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds, and people and tongue, tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with their white robes and palms in their hands. Mm. So we see here that they are a great multitude which no man can number. There is no number for the tribulation marks a great number. But according to Song of Solomon 6, 9, the very next verse after verse 8, we read of the bride of Jesus, she is only one. My love, my undefiled is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice of her that bear her. The daughters saw her and blessed her, aid the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Here we read that there, are, there may be virgins without number, but only one undefiled one. You see, she also is undefiled. She is also a virgin. But there is something beautiful about her. He says... My love. Or there is something special about her. Her whole life is centered around Jesus. Jesus is her consuming passion. Her holiness, her undefiled state is not simply because she loves being undefiled, but it is a Christ-centered purity. It's all out of love for Jesus. Everything because of Jesus. My love, my undefiled. How beautifully Jesus boasts about her. All shall praise, even the queens and the concubines, they are all praising her. This is our calling. We are not called to be just part of the ten virgins. We are called to be those who love Jesus with that consuming passion. When we love him like that, we know we will be not doing the mistakes that the wise virgins made. One, we won't be asleep. Because this chaste virgin is caught up at the coming of Jesus. So she was not sleeping. She was alert. She was awake. Secondly, she did not waste the oil. She used every opportunity to, to use the oil that God was giving her. Thirdly, she allowed the trimming to take place in her life. We all need correction. We are all bad by nature. There is nothing good in us. 
Let God have the freedom to correct you. Let God have the freedom to trim you. Let God have the freedom to do anything. Do not resist that correction. Do not choose a comfortable life. Do not choose a path called the Broadway where you will never be corrected. Even as believers we can make that mistake. You may be a member of the UPC. But remember there are always three groups in the UPC. One, the group called the bride who will be caught up. Two, the group called the wise virgins. They are left behind but they at least die as martyrs and they are they're caught up in the midnight, in the middle. They can at least go to new heaven. But there is also a group in our midst called the foolish virgins. They are caught up neither at the coming, secret coming of Jesus, nor at the harvest or the, the day of the gathering of the martyrs. They are those who will take the mark of the beast, the mark of the Antichrist. Foolish virgins who will end up in hell one day. That is why don't look at other believers, don't look at their faults, don't look at their failures, don't look at their mistakes. Let us focus our attention on Jesus. Our bridegroom is coming and we must be made ready for him. Let us therefore be filled with that all-consuming passion for our Jesus. Don't look at those, you know, even while meeting is going on, sometimes I, I look out. I know some parents, they are, it's so sad that they are not able to pay full attention to the word of God because their children disturb them. They have to take their children out. But not all parents are taking them out because the children are forcing them. In some cases, the parents are forcing the children to go out. They'll pinch them, make them cry and say, I have to take my child out. Why? It's so boring sitting here. So what do they do? They go out of this hall and they enjoy their time outside. I have seen while sitting here, that's why I always have that open. I see them talking to each other. They're discussing work, they're discussing this, discussing that. Some leave the campus and they're out there enjoying the lovely sunshine. When I was in the UK, I noticed some believers, not our, our church, but other churches, they would always leave the presence of God, but they were acting busy. They would either carry a spanner or a wire or a telephone or something, some excuse to move out of the presence of God. They can't, they can't enjoy the presence of God. We do not want to be people who lose our delight in Jesus. You are in this hall not because of anyone else. You are here because of Jesus. Because you love him. We want to be that God-centered church. We want Christ to be the focus of our whole service, of our whole love, our whole worship. Let Jesus be the one. Let him draw us closer and closer. And may the Lord prepare us for the day when he returns to take that chaste virgin away shall we stand.